at about three o'clock in the afternoon, I get a phone call and it's Ian. I'm like, oh, yes, my favorite client. Ian, how are you, mate? <laughs> and he was like, Mike, I've got bad news, man. Unfortunately, we're going to have to, um, we're going to have to finish the engagement with you guys. Ooh. And, and at the time, that was 60% of our revenue. Ooh. And so I started walking home and then it started pouring down <laughs> with rain. Oh, you and can't I didn't write this stuff up. Huh? <laughs> I know. And I was like, you know what? And then I remember thinking to myself at that moment, it was kind of a liberating experience. So I remember thinking, I'm like, if this is as bad as it's going to get, like, fucking let it rain. No one's ever lucky. I, mean, I think the only lucky you get in life is where you're born and then you make the rest. Stick around. It's going to be a good ride. Yeah. I can't even see you over there with the plant, mate. You, 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 you you're like camouflaged. <laughs> when did this pop up? This Not near the last time. No, I opened Who the window, a bit of natural. <laughs> got natural light. Yeah. Last is this week. another podcast that's joined us? Oh, or <laughs> Come on, boys. <laughs> it's your replacement, mate. <laughs> Eddie. How does the guest get around We now? thought it'd be more interesting. How does the guest get around here? Come, oh, the long way. Yeah, Making them work hard. Yeah, Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> come on, boys. All right, guys, let's get straight into the guest. He's an entrepreneur at heart, CEO of Australia's largest online marketplace for new property. He was an early investor in Australia's number one nano gifting business, two-time Deloitte Tech Fast 50. Back to back. Mm. Bang, bang. Um, he's voted Australia's coolest employer. Oh, I like that one. You guys didn't make that shortlist? <laughs> no, we didn't. <laughs> he's passionate about affecting positive change in the world while still kicking ass at business. He's on the board of the innovative charity Igniting Change, helping grassroots community organisation. And to put it simply, this guy's an absolute winner. We're honoured to have him here. Give it up for Urban CEO Michael Byrne. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> Like how are you, man? What's up, man? <laughs> hey, buddy. Mate, excited. Welcome to, to the fun. pod. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, Appreciate yeah. it. Sorry about the the intro. No, it was a good intro, actually, Pete. Sorry, that was good. <laughs> you nailed it, man. What are you talking about? He did about? nail it. I thought I was all right. Down the barrel. The people, the people won't see the 40, oh. 40, other, 40 other takes we did. <laughs> <laughs> right oh, Let's go. Oh, awesome, man. Thanks for thanks for coming in. As we're doing the the groundwork on yourself, you've done a lot. At the ripe old age of thirty-two, <laughs> um, but yeah, we I guess we wanted to start on start on urban. Talk to us about Secret Garden, like where it started, and I know we're having a bit of chat off air about the things that drove you to push on and push forward. And I'm not sure if it, it was Social Garden, not Secret Garden. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I, 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 Sorry. Do, no, it's absolutely no stress. We've done heaps of this video stuff, and I and it's never Secret Garden. Time. I've just. You know, just been there a few well, times. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like well, it's a good yeah, job. What are you wearing a corset at Secret Garden there, PK? <laughs> oh, <laughs> some, good, some good times there. Someone's yeah. walking him around. <laughs> oh, is that what it is? <laughs> no, I don't know. I'm I reckon really. if you look up Secret Garden, who knows what's coming. Were you wearing a colour shirt or just the grey again? Good. So cool, man. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, man. Really, and really appreciate it. Um, man, you've done a lot to this point. Um, we struggled to sort of nail it all down. But <laughs> for, for us, for us, we really want to talk about, um, you know, Social Garden, where it started, off to urban, um, you know, the challenges you've had through that time. Um, and I guess the reasons why you potentially you pivoted and wanted to do other things. Like, yeah, we, we find that super, super interesting, man. Yeah, man. Well, it's, um, it's been a journey and it feels like I've been doing it for a long time. Time and it's been very slow, um, but then you kind of zoom out and stuff does kind of some things happen quicker than you think. But that's wild. Almost, it's almost wild it, that you it, think it's slow at thirty two <laughs> and yeah, to have so achieved what you've achieved. Like far out. Yeah. My business partner and I we work a lot. Yep. <laughs> and so it's kind of like yeah. you know if you can stack sixty or seventy hours in a week every week for fifteen years, it kind of yeah. you know you start getting the extrapolated effect of that over time. But certainly, um, if you are if <laughs> if you had a little. Sp- um, camera and the discussions that we have it's like how do we fucking get it to go and faster, blow faster, this faster. Up. Yeah. you know it's yeah, definitely yeah. more that vibe than we're like wow look how fast it's going well it sounds like it sounds like that's what you've done it sounds like those meetings <laughs> yeah those, <laughs> those conversations <laughs> have to led good, to some good, good moves yeah because yeah. um, you know your social garden and then and then on to urban you know you mentioned earlier that you were doing some things there and you are like I want to. I want to do something else. I want to put fuel on the fire. Yeah. So, so how did that transition go? Because you were saying you, you were. I remember. Yeah. The social garden. <laughs> it's got me nervous now. But uh, yeah, at social garden, obviously 
that you know so that for the people at home that don't know that's a that's a, a like a digital agency focusing in the property property space and, yeah. and education yeah it was so, pro- property development so we work with most of the like a lot of the listed property developers like Mervac and Fraser's and the big boys the big boys and um and then on the education side we kind of help the, a lot of the universities um in Australia recruit students from both overseas and um and domestically as well yeah right and w- and what was the change there that uh, that took you on this crazy uh, because you know th- that that social garden's certainly interesting, but this urban rocket ship that you're on, that's the one I think that we really want to bunker into and understand. You know that journey and uh, particularly like the acquisition and and uh, you know how you've bootstrapped it from I think zero to a hundred employees. Yeah, we're super interested to understand. You, you're saying you feel like you're moving slow, but for us, we're <laughs> sitting on the sidelines, going, "Oh my god, how, how much is this guy doing? And how quick is he moving? And and some of those moves." directly throw fuel on that fire right so the acquisition being an example sort of thing yeah i think um you know we think a lot about what is the future of property gonna look like and the future of education and the, the future we i'd say we're just generally interested in what the future kind of looks like and how things are changing um and kind of when, when i was at university uh, with one of my other co-founders from social garden his name's andrew we had a music events business um where we would tour bands and djs and things around the university towns which by the way it's like a 19 year old was the greatest job it was the greatest it was the greatest and um and you know it was going okay for the first few and we were doing kind of like pub crawls and stuff like that and then facebook kind of launched in new zealand and one of the things that we were kind of, oh, this is kind of interesting. It's kind of this new thing. Everyone's on it. And everyone's, oh my God, are you on Facebook kind of thing? Which seems so weird now because it's like everyone's fucking on Facebook yeah. or, or <laughs> Instagram or whatever it is, you know. Um, but at the time it was kind of a pretty new thing. And we had a friend that gave us this like little snippet of code that we could enter into the address bar um, and automatically invite everybody that a person was friends with automatically to an event. Oh, you hacked the book. Wow. They on. hacked the book early. <laughs> Love sorry, it. sorry, Mark. Yeah. Uh, but we, <laughs> I don't know. But we, we kind of were doing that and and um, and we were able to invite, you know, tens, like, you know, h- hundreds of thousands of people to these kind of like low-key club nights. And, uh, and then that really worked effectively and we uh, were off to the races kind of thing. And uh, after we kind of had that business um, and we were kind of, tired and hung over from two years of doing this. Um, we can't live this life forever. Yeah, pretty much. And then it was because it was like it would rain one day and then the whole thing would be a complete disaster and it would be good weather and it would be like a home run kind of thing. And so after that um, experience, we I moved to Wellington, had another startup, lost everything I had um, at that time. It was kind of like an online marketplace that connected graphic designers with um, like 99 designs exactly like 99 designs Fuck, and that's yeah. Australian as well right yeah so that we launched at exactly the same time yeah because I was using them early we were talking about one of my earlier businesses yeah and I, I man branding all of that back way back you know early 2000s was yeah using sites like that for sure yeah and and exactly and it was um you know we I learned a lot through the experience lost everything that I had from the had from the previous one and when I moved um from Australia with a bag of clothes and about a, a couple of hundred bucks and I was living on my mate's couch um, in Brunswick East um, for like a solid three months um, while I was trying to work out what I was going to do next and he was so kind. Cheers, John. Appreciate you, brother. Shout out, Johnny. <laughs> Shout out, Johnny boy. <laughs> yeah, it. The, the place is called The Lodge and there was about 20 of us <laughs> all living there together. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we, um, anyway, so my friend Andrew came over um, and um, and my other my current business partner, George, came over and uh, and we, I was talking to them one night, explaining kind of what happened with the other the the um, UPIC business is what it was called. It was similar to Ninety Nine Designs, and uh, and it was kind of like you know the thing we got right about them. I don't think we were that good at running music businesses, but the whole social media thing was like it seemed very obvious at that point that it was going to become massive. Yeah. And so we were just went back and thought, you know, let's just kind of go back to the thing that we know works, and we kind of didn't really have that much of a plan we didn't know we were going to work in property for example we had no idea that you know that was going to be the path but we were just like let's just focus on something that we think is probably true that social media is going to be big and it's probably overlooked generally 
because mm. um, it was kind of just like young people at that point were using it. Um, and so we started there and kind of, and then we kind of just worked it out as we kind of went and we got new information and we kind of just would follow the kind of, follow the flow, you know. I love that. So yeah. like it would have been a dint to the ego, obviously young, had a business and then it just went under. What gave you the confidence then, I guess, to go again? You know, I've been asked that before and it was never even, I don't know, it was just naivety probably. It never even occurred to me that I wouldn't do it again. Really? And so did you, it didn't even bother you? And you knew not you were not going to work for someone? Like you always knew that you were going to run your own, you were just an entrepreneur at heart? I guess so. I kind of like most of when I was growing up, I thought I was going to be a teacher actually. Um, and because I like like working with people and I love sharing the experience of learning things with people um, and kind of, yeah, I it was between that or I wanted to be, I was like too short and slow to be a great basketball player, but I really, <laughs> I really loved basketball and I was like, maybe I could be a coach or whatever. Mm. And cause I love the idea of putting the teams together and, and kind of working with people and learning new things together. And, you know, that's kind of, um, you know, ended up being that it's also like that. Well, you've kind of done that on, well, yeah. You've, yeah, you've, well, you've exactly, you've kind of done that on steroids, right? Yeah. You've done, you know, you've, which we're, I'm sure we're going to hear about as we, as we keep moving forward, but that's what you've, and you've I, done. I, Sorry, Benny. No, you I, go, you I, go, man. I love the fact that when it all boiled down, when the onion was peeled right back, and you had your had your swag, you're living with your 20 other people in Brunswick, <laughs> you went, "All right, what are we good at? Yeah, what are we good at? Yeah. And because we have those moments, we go, well, "What's worked? Like, let's break it down and go, yeah. well, "What's worked? Let's double down on that." Yeah, and and sometimes mm. it's obvious, but unless you stop in time mm. and actually consciously think about it, it just passes buy in the subconscious sort of thing doesn't it so you got to yeah so the fact that you're able all right well that works let's put all our effort into at that, that age as well and then and then that's where social garden yeah so we started time. social garden we were like okay cool let's kind of and i was like i'm gonna go back to the partner that i knew i worked well with in the past which was yep. archie and yep. then we started um and then we had george who could design websites and code and do all sorts of stuff yeah, yeah. um and we kind of partnered up with him and the three of us kind of got started yeah yeah nice so you picked your team you picked your, your path of what of what was going to work and sort of yeah. here you are. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, I, I think someone told me this one day and it's so on point, which is kind of like the business stuff is a lot like driving in the dark mm. where you're never going to have the full view of like where you're trying to go and trying to focus on, okay, but what about if this happens or this or this or this? And you kind of, people get so caught up in terms of, oh. Trying to the, map it right out. Trying yeah. to map it right yeah. out. But when we get to 5,000 employees, we'll have this problem. It's like, fuck, if you can get to 5,000 yeah. employees, you can have <laughs> a lot of resources yeah. to solve that problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I think kind of the paralysis that people feel in relation to kind of just not, it kind of stop makes them not start. Or what they do, what I've seen happen is that they, Tr like um, put a toe in the water but it's the first sign that things aren't working they're like oh it's because the idea is shit and blah 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 blah, yeah. blah and all this stuff's going to happen -doubt. and so yep. they do something else and they end up just kind of jumping from thing to thing to thing to thing never kind of really committing and I think mm -hmm. you know elements of that is correct in the sense that if it's kind of not working and it's really not working and you've been doing it for a long time and you've you've been doing the work and we all know if you've been doing the work or not if, you, yeah, if you've been on. doing the yeah. work yep. yeah. and it's not working then maybe it's you know to look for something else but you know you've got to open enough doors to really be sure and I, I, yeah. I, I heard a saying back in the day that most people and I've latched onto this over the years but most people tend to give up when something good's about to happen, right? So just you work for, like you said, you do all that work and then just as it's about to happen and you might, you know, you start to lose interest or motivation or passion or whatever it is and and, and you stop and if you had it just gone that little bit further, things might have been a little bit different. It's definitely the case. I mean, like we've kind of, you know, we've got our different businesses and I don't think there's ever been a time when all of them have been firing at the same time, ever. And it's like, there's always something to kind of be gutted about or disappointed about. There's always something to be excited about. And I kind of, I think a lot of this stuff, uh, particularly for people that are kind of getting into business for the first time or, or, you know, a relatively earlier stage, I think it's just getting comfortable with the feeling of there's always going to be some shit that's bad. Yeah. Oh yeah. And just being okay with it and being like, you know what, there's some bad stuff, there's some good stuff. And it's kind of when the good stuff happens, not being like, yeah. The good stuff, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's all because I'm like, I've done all this great stuff and, and finally the world realizes how good I am. Because eventually that stuff's not going to work anymore because it doesn't <laughs> work for long. And yeah. then you've got to have some other crisis. And in the same respect, when you kind of hit that crisis period, getting too down on yourself and beating yourself up and like getting into this kind of negative talk with your own self is just, you know, both things are bad. So it's about trying to find the balance between 
being like pleased when things are going well, but not being too emotionally connected to the outcome. And when things aren't going badly, just focusing on kind of what's next, what do we know works? Let's go back to that and just focus on that. It's so true. We, I, like I suffer from self um, imposter syndrome, big time. Always self doubt myself. And then my partner or my business partner, my wife, she's always, no, you got to see the positive side of things and keep going. And I'm always the one looking, but what if, what if this, what if that? And I've learned over time that if that happens, oh, well, we'll find a way to solve that and move on. And, yeah. you're, and you're worrying about things out of your control, right? Exactly. So you're yeah, putting yeah. energy into things that you can't control. So you just lower your eyes and you focus, like you said, peel it back to what you trust or what you know and mm. what you can control. And keep, and keep backing yourself in as well. Like yeah. like you say, if you're on the right path and yeah, it'll it'll get there. It'll get there. Totally. I mean, we, our education business is probably the most recent example where we kind of had like a tough period during COVID. And, you know, we've got a new person, her name's uh, Rosie, and she's running that business for us. And it go was, Rosie. yeah, go, which is absolute gun. And um, she was kind of, we kind of promoted her into the role uh, maybe like nine months ago or so. And, um, and it was kind of in the midst of COVID when things were like particularly difficult. And, you know, th- things started sales are slowing down a little bit. And we were mm-hmm. kind of like, we call it like eating, we're eating a bit of shit kind of thing for a while. <laughs> and so we were just like going back to the things when we looked back and we thought, you know, when Social Garden Property was going well, when Urban was going well, or when the education business was going well, what were the things that we were doing then? Yeah. And then just kind of stepping back, focusing on those things, going back to the stuff that we know works and then doubling doing, the, doing the press ups and just doing the work. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. It's awesome. Um, and then and that's and that's a lesson is taking that bit of time and reflecting on what has worked. Um, and then like we're saying, doubling down on that. I, I called yeah, I her. It. I called her the other like last week, and I was like, "Hey," because we had like an unbelievable. We've been on a really good run with the education stuff with her leading it. And I called her and I said, "I was like, Rosie, I was like, this is great." And kind of said to someone, "I was like, you know, enjoy enjoy the moment when it's going well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but know that." It's not going to be like this. It's not this yeah. easy. And we, yeah. it's, it's not this easy. Yep. And it's going to go back to being hard. But I want you to remember, what were the things that we've been doing for the last eight weeks that led us to the position now where yep. it's going really well? And remember those things and write them down because at some point soon, it's not going to be happening. And you're going to go back to that list. You're going to read through it. And you'll know and, what you need to do. And you'll know what you need to yeah. do. And, and so she's done that. And it's kind of, you know, that time will come, but hopefully not too soon. Yeah, yeah, and that's <laughs> I'm I'm listening to that thinking that's fantastic leadership, Mike, you know. And 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 she's probably not the only one you do that stuff with. Like you've got a big team under yourself, you know. If you are, you know, are there things that you like to I guess wake up of the morning, come in in the day and go how can I how can I make people feel good about what they're doing? How can how can we celebrate certain things, but how can I pull people up out of the shit as well? You yeah, know, when the, when it's going poorly. Yeah, I mean like we've been doing more like we've got I would say maybe like five or six like business leaders, I guess, that we kind of work with from either from our stuff that's kind of our core businesses or stuff that we're invested in or whatever. And um, and th- that's kind of the joy. I get so much joy out of that process of like working with them, helping them to kind of- Giving find, them opportunities. Giving them opportunities, yeah, finding confidence in themselves. Because I think a lot of the time people just, you know, they haven't, a lot of people just have not been told it's like, you can fucking do this shit. Yeah. Like yeah. believe in yourself. <laughs> and a lot you of people just look after it. themselves, right? Especially yeah. people as they push up, like you put in your position, Mike, where, you know, you could, you could, I guess, ostracize yourself from the team and just let them all go about and all the people that you've appointed to go and do it. But sounds like you're out on the front line, boots on the ground, trying to empower them and teach them the lessons that you've got over the journey, which is cool. Yeah. I think we've had, I think it's now, we kind of tracked this, George and I, I think we've had five or six different people that have worked at Social Garden and are now in CEO roles. Wow, and yeah. like we're like we love that because from it's the like, ground up, bottom yeah. up, from yeah. the bottom yeah. up, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and then you know we're kind of we're proud of that and we're proud of them and we're like stay close to them. And- Be part of the success, the success, I, I would suggest. Now, Mick, can you sort of bridge the gap, mate? So you you how you got into the property, how you you said at the start that wasn't the plan. You just ended up going down that way with Social Garden, and then how you transitioned from the property in Social Garden to now, you know founder and CEO of, you know, the largest online marketplace for new property in Australia. Yeah. I'll start with the social garden because I think it's quite, um, it's an interesting way to kind of think about how to get to product market fit because I think that's the real challenge, right? It's like it, it, you, there's a myriad of different businesses you can launch. You could do anything, right? So it's like, what what should you do? And then I think it starts with what's a theme that you think you appreciate that is tr- more true than what most people realise? 
Um, and my business partner, Andrew, who I mentioned before that had the music stuff with, he's also a shareholder and on our board now. He, when he left, he kind of went back. I remember, I'll never forget when he called me and he said, you know, we've kind of, we kind of parted ways from him being an executive in the company. And he was like, you know, Mike, he's like, the the thing, it was, it was social media. And he's like, the next thing is clean energy. And he's like, I don't know what I'm going to do in the clean energy space, but it's going to be something and it's mm. going to be big. And I was like, and I believe believed him when he said that to me mm. and um and so then they went on and have since raised hundreds of millions of dollars oh, from uh wow. of, of debt to provide um provide kind of funding to put um solar panels on top of retail mm. and like shopping centers and stuff like that and schools and airports and all sorts of things like that from like a big clean energy and that now that like that business is called solar bay it's like smashing it but it's kind of yeah. that kind of same idea of like what's something that i think is I'm kind of naturally got some kind of advantage in, or I think to be true, probably more than the average person. Um, and then starting there. And so when we started with the social stuff, we kind of were, when we moved out of living on this person's, at my friend's couch, and we got this apartment in the CBD, and we got the apartment there because we thought that, um, you know, we could probably get a job that would be close to where the apartment was if it was in the city. Um, and so we got this job, uh, we, the first job when we kind of first started Social Garden, both um, Andrew and I, George was already kind of running, um, like I guess the very first iteration of Social Garden that was more like in the web space, it was called Cat House. And he was kind of up and running on that stuff. But Andrew and I, um, we were we went to sell, we basically went and sold software for the same company together oh, yeah. and we were living together at the same time as well and the place we got the job at a key part of the reason we got the job is because it's 150 meters away from yeah. out, out where we lived <laughs> so it worked yeah and so it worked and so what we would do is we would wait to our lunch break literally the second the clock went across to the lunch break we were in the like poorest fitting cheapest suits you've ever seen in your life we would go down the elevator we would run up the road as excited as you can imagine mm. and we had a phone that was in his bedroom which is our makeshift office and then we would get a we would get the phone book out and we would just go call oh, for cool. call yeah. and sit across from each other and go you go now i go now you wow. go now i go and we would do it for an hour and we did it every day for and, and what we were calling and asking to do was like you know this new thing facebook you know you've got to be on Facebook, you've got to be on social media, you guys should, we, we can manage your kind of, uh, we can create content and, and post stuff on your Facebook. This is when kind of likes and all that kind of stuff was a thing. Um, and uh, and that's kind of where we started. And so we would go, but then what would happen is when we kind of got started, we would uh, go see the client, uh, the the when we'd pull like the occasional sickie to go see the customer. <laughs> and, uh, and they would be like, you know, where's, like where's the ROI kind of thing? Where's the value mm -hmm. kind of coming from? And we were kind of not that clear on that, but we knew <laughs> that we would see that the kind of they would get it would get this huge reach and all these people would see it. And um and one of the customers was a property client, uh, was like a, a development um in Windava, I think it was, and uh and he said to us, oh you know what would be good is if you could guys could get leads. And we're like, yeah, yeah, leads. We're like, what's the lead? And he's like, oh, it's like, <laughs> it's this thing. It's this thing. It's like basically giving me some information. I can actually call someone and close, sell them some property. So that guy was, he was the turning, like he was the thing. You guys create a love when you create, because our journey we were talking earlier, so similar, man. I had a, one of my first businesses, Stomp Marketing, because the same thing, I discovered this social media stuff <laughs> and the websites, but it was a hard sell, man, trying to, you know, trying to, convince people there was value there when it was early on but it sounds like that was a pivotal moment right like so, bulb moment sort of thing yeah yeah mm -hmm. it was because it, we weren't really sure how we were going to get the leads because we're like oh yeah like, fuck, it would be good if we could get leads because even, the, to do that. <laughs> even the tools on the platform the tools on the platform weren't even advanced back then either mm -hmm. were they nah this is like 2012 i guess 2000 yeah would have been two, 2012 yeah and um and so it was pretty early doors, but at the same time that we had Social Garden, I also on the side launched buyabitcoin.com. Oh, shit. And, <laughs> Please tell me early you bought days. a Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. oh. And so but all it was essentially, it was like the most stripped back version of like a crypto marketplace that you could possibly imagine. Like CoinSpot started like that, I think. I think, yeah. Yeah, so it was, all it was was a form that um, people could kind of download an information pack about Bitcoin, and that's kind of how we got started and we started getting leads. And so we would think, we saw the kind of, the fact that you know this idea and like we were reading white papers about different crypto related stuff at the time and you would enter your contact details and to get download the white paper about probably like early day door kind of ethereum or whatever it was 
and um, and then we would enter the details and obviously create a lead that way. Yeah. And so we thought, well, what about if we took the idea from the crypto stuff, which is to da- like exchanging co- value oh, yeah. for someone to give you their contact details, then maybe we could create a um, like a, a one page website, which is everyone's like knows the landing page now. We can make it a one page website where the only thing that you can do is download this information pack about this property development, mm. and we'll make and we'll get the person to give us their contact details. And um, wow. and that's pretty much how yeah, the whole thing started. Spot on, man. That's awesome. Because mm. I went on that exact same journey, dude. Yeah, and I obviously knocked it out the park, relatively speaking. <laughs> but man, yeah, that that's 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 cool because back then it was yeah because it was so early back then you know like it was it was a hard slog and like you said that imagine if you hold on to what buy bitcoin.com today and would that be yeah, yeah that? I, I, so, I sold the company actually like shortly after only for a very small amount of money but it was to um bitcoin.com.au so we were like sharing an office with this like crypto company that's Oof. now listed called banksa which is like a um a payments gateway <sighs> kind of thing to trade so when people want to buy crypto they kind of go through their kind of payments infrastructure or whatever and they're able to convert like fiat currency into cryptocurrency um but it, it sounds like it's and again when you kind of compress this stuff down it sounds like it's like oh then we did this then we did this i can promise you it was a very long way from that in fact i remember one on the first week that i kind of was working full-time in social garden this is like right at the start and our office was in the big red X building. If, I'm, I don't know if you know the one on um, Church Street in Richmond. There, it's across the road from where REA, realestate.com. Oh, yeah, is now. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we were in there and I remember we had this client um, and it was one of our first customers and he was this dude that was actually, his office was next door. The, his shop, which is like a supplement stop shop, was next door to the office we were working in. So it was like the dream result because we could go see the client, close the deal and then kind of work with them as well. And he called me and his name is Ian and um, from Evelyn Fay and he is the biggest legend. And if I had to put it down to any one customer that pretty much got us to get started, I would hand he's, on a He's the guy. He's yep. the guy, Ian, and he's the man. Um, and anyhow, so it gives me goosebumps thinking about it because it was so like, it was it was such a moment. Someone back saw what you were doing, gave you an opportunity, and then you guys were smart enough to just hammer, just go and, and take the opportunity. That's it. And, and so anyway, so Ian calls me up on the kind of Monday and we'd had like, you know, a, we were – 22 or whatever at the time we'd had like this wild party in the weekend and I was like a little bit like still hung over on Monday and like went to work and I, but I was like so excited because I was like yes finally like I can do it again and we're back we're back baby and so went to the office in the Big Red X building and at about three o'clock in the afternoon I get a phone call and it's Ian I'm like oh yes my favorite client Ian how are you mate <laughs> and he was like Mike I've got bad news man unfortunately we're gonna have to um we're gonna have to finish the engagement with you guys Ooh. And and at the time that was sixty percent of our revenue. Ooh. Oh, that <laughs> hurts. It was it was bad. It was bad. And it was. I remember thinking to myself, I've kind of let down my friend, and I've like let myself down, and I was like so disappointed. And I remember got walking, walking to the East Richmond train station from up the road, and just like feeling like the biggest loser of all time, and going to the Mikey thing and pulling out my wallet. And then going to going to pay the yeah. thing, and I I don't, for people that are in Melbourne, you might recognise the sound of bam, bam, bam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it was essentially, Whoops. yeah. I was like, oh no. I was like, oh thank God. I just get my card out. Put tried to put four dollars on the account, declined as well. And I remember being like, fuck, I've like lost our biggest customer. Of now, I can't even get a bus ride, a, a um, train ride home. I can't top up my market. This sucks. And so I started walking home and then it started pouring down with rain. <laughs> oh, you and can't I didn't write this stuff up. Huh? <laughs> I know. And I was like, you know what? And then I remember thinking to myself at that moment it was kind of a liberating experience. Cause I remember thinking, I'm like, if this is as bad as it's going to get, like fucking let it rain and just yeah. like let it go and just letting the kind of, um, letting the kind of uh, emotions, just letting, letting it kind of go and just move, trying to move forward and stay focused. And the next day we got the client back and everything kind of continued from there. But we all have these kind of low moments in our lives, respect, yeah, yeah. whether it's in business or in your personal life or whatever. And I think it's just sometimes letting go of the things that you can't control. And I think in that moment, it was like when it was raining, I'm like, I can't fucking stop it raining. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, like, it's going to rain, rain, you know. And yeah. build resilience, right? Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. And to recognize it that early too in, in your life. At yeah, 22, 22 man, that's super impressive. Wow. Yeah. That's, to not, yeah. let it, not let it beat you down and 
I guess, yeah, you couldn't couldn't control the client leaving. You couldn't control the weather, weather. either. Yeah. So it was a nice just reminder that, like, let's focus on the things we can focus yeah. on. Um, and that's what it sound, sounds like you did. And, and so what did you say? You got the client back the next day? We got day? the client got- back the very next day. And I, like, told my friend when I got – because I was so, I was so like – Nervous about telling him about telling him because I, I felt like I'd let him down, yeah. and he was like, you know, it's all good, man. It's all good. Like, hug it out. It's all good. We're gonna be sweet. Mm. Like, fuck yeah, who yeah. cares? I'm gonna say I'll just stay here longer until we're all good. And then, um, and then the, the next day we got the client back, and then we got another client, and then we kind of worked out the property thing, and then we kind of were able to apply the same idea to the education market, and then that year we kind of jumped from like a 50 grand revenue to like 2 million and then 6 million and then it just went duh, duh, wow. Duh, 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 duh. wow all from that That's rainy a big, and you were doing the educa- <laughs> yeah. you were doing the education back then 2012 yeah uh, yep. yeah so that was when the whole RTO kind of situation was going down yeah. um and uh and all the kind of universities were facing disruption and all the stuff so everyone was kind of working out that leads were pretty important for businesses in the education and property markets and and um we, we, we kind of went from there. Were you ready for that jump though, from going fifty grand a year to two mil? Is it? Yeah, I, I guess so. It was kind of like I don't know. I'm just trying to think. It, what was really important is having like good early staff. Yeah, and we had people. the best people. You know, yep. and one of them, her name is Christine. Don't get sick of hearing it. No, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't get sick of hearing that because it's yeah. spot on. It's the one yeah. hard work, good people. Yeah, exactly, man. And we had this like, you know, we had these people that one of my friends from back home where, where I grew up, he came, he moved to Australia at the same mm. time and he came on. And then we had um, Andrew, the dude that I was living with at the time. Um, his cousin came on board as well, whose name was, and those two actually went off and launched a really, what ended up being a really successful company in New Zealand later. They were one of the ones that were the CEOs. Um, and and then we had this young girl who like, when she started, him's Christine. And when she started as an intern writing for us, like just writing content. And she was like so nervous. She could barely like look us in the eyes at the beginning of the meeting. Mm. And um, and she stayed with us for six years. And then she went and worked at Adore Beauty for a year or two years. And now she's just joined us back at Urban again. Yeah, nice. um, and so it's just kind of when they do the full circle and come back, it's like, mm. you know, for it gets the feels. <laughs> <laughs> Spot on. No, you going? Yeah, no, I'm going. I'm going. No, no, that's, <laughs> that, that's awesome because we hear it in here a lot. People, we've got our businesses. People, um, I guess what? Yeah, what? What I'm thinking about is like, so circa how many people do you reckon? You, you now? Yeah, yeah. About a hundred. About a hundred across about across the business. Across like Snap Listings, which is in the US. We've got a business partner in that. We're kind of like partners with her, and then Urban social garden and student garden which is we've since spun out our education business that's the education one business. Yep. but yes those ones combined is about 100 so so do you you know is 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 that heavy or, or or do you think plugging in the right people like you know you said earlier you got a lot more people but you got a lot more resource you got a lot you got a bigger army to help you you know does yeah. that does that make it lighter or or, or, or heavier in, with, with that sort of numbers um it's I think it, uh, it's a lot of it's about the self-awareness stuff. And I'm kind of like, I think over time I've become increasingly clear on the shit that I'm hopeless at. Mm. And one of the things I'm just not great at is managing people. Yeah. In terms wow. of like. Yeah, right. I wouldn't, I wouldn't pick that. I wouldn't pick that. Yeah. I think I'm quite a good leader. I would say leader. Oh, so it's a diff- there's, there's a difference. You're there's spot difference. on. Yeah, there is a difference. Yeah. yeah. And my business partner, George, who, uh, who, um, who I've been working with and he's like my best mate as well. And we've been working together um, for, you know, since we started. And uh, he is an unbelievably good manager, yep. And very good process, op- like operations, all that kind of stuff. And he started as kind of the designer, and I was kind of like the business guy. He was kind of the design guy, and it's kind of ended up being, um, you know, he's ended up being kind of. He's the CEO now of Social Garden, much better CEO for the stage the business is at than what I was. Um, and yeah, so I think to answer your question, does it get heavier? Kind of, but then you kind of just are able to afford better staff. Yeah, and you, and you kind of get to know yourself better in terms of what you're good at and and what you're not so good at, and like we have like amazing leaders in the business that we kind of that suit um my leadership that are kind of like the yin to the yang on my style and George's yeah, yeah. style and and all these other things. So you know we have the same thing with Urban with a guy called Craig Craig Holmes, and he's just unbelievable. Like at some point he's probably going to be a better CEO of Urban <laughs> than I will be. Then the same way it happened with Social Garden. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and um, that's interesting. But it's like you say, it's a self awareness, isn't it? Rather than sort of going, oh, well, I'll do this and I'll do that, and I've got to do it all. It's stepping back and going, who do we need in what area? 
you know, and you're and you're big on that one. Yeah, absolutely, one, right? absolutely. Now yeah. I've got one. So, and why did we pivot? Why, what was the talk is about the pivot? Your personal pivot from social garden, yeah, into into urban. Yeah, we kind of, um, you know, we we always talk about um, confronting the brutal facts and like only the paranoid survive. And we talk about these types of things all the time, and we're kind of constant. We I'd say we're almost like I would say like futurists in the sense mm. that we're just obsessed with new technology and what's coming and the how's what's happening going to happen with climate change what's happening with crypto all these kind of yeah, the blockchain is that going to the blockchain yeah. all this stuff so we're like super just gen, i would say hobbyists in that space yeah, not yep. even related to work and so we kind of always think about well, what's facebook trying to do and what's google trying to do in the, in and the and why are they doing and it? why are they doing yeah, yeah, these yeah. things and you know when we look at social garden we were uh paranoid that we had too much exposure to facebook and google and that we knew that if they could, that like that kind of our partner in a sense, but they would easily be happy to disintermediate us if they could, yep. which basically mm -hmm. means like go around us or whatever. Um, and you know that was our opinion. They haven't told us that or anything like that. And maybe I'm wrong, but I'm well, that sort of happened not. recently. If, you, if didn't that <laughs> something happened in you know? Didn't, uh, didn't in, you say it broke or it tried to trick us? Or something? Oh no, no, more about like Facebook. Because the issues they were having with the Australian government, they turned off the news, right? They stopped. Mm. They stopped uh, just showing the news. So you just, man, the pandemic in the recent years just goes to show, like, if it can happen, it will. And, and like you said, if all your eggs are in the one basket, game over. Wow, not game over. You, but you're sitting duck, aren't mm. you? Yeah, and I mean, like for us, you know, we wanted to make sure that you know we've got a commitment to it. The people that choose to come and work for us, because like all of our staff, they're all super smart high, like we have a like high achieving type people and they want to work in a place where it's kind of hard and they get challenged and all these kinds of things and you know we thought well what happens if facebook and google if something happens to facebook and google whether it's them coming like doing something to us mm. or people don't use facebook or instagram or whatever anymore or there's some other some other thing happens basically that is beyond our, outside of our control and we felt like there was too many things that were kind of outside of our control we, what we did have our control was our commitment to the people that chose to come and work with yeah. us and we wanted to make sure that if something happens with that stuff we've got a good place for them to go um and it basically it's turned out that it hasn't happened in the way that we thought um and social garden you know we've just had the best you know, we've had the best year we've ever had and before that and we're having another cracker this year so but it was just kind of this paranoid idea that we kind of had too much exposure to things that we couldn't control and we wanted and we felt um that sense of commitment to the people that are working with us that we wanted to have a plan B and and we wanted to start early because everything feels like it takes. So eight. urban was a plan B? It was kind of like, you know, if something happens with Facebook and social and, and that it would directly impact social garden, yep. then like we've got urban and we've got all these, we're going to be in a position where we've got our own asset mm. in terms of like a consumer facing brand. Yep. We've got like really fucking good people in those businesses and social garden and um, it kind of gives us a pretty good backup plan for those people to go. And oh, across. man, and you know what? Mm. You may not be fucking wrong either, right? Because if you think about, like, the metaverse, right? This is the new, the NFTs and the metaverse and all that, and obviously Facebook's changed its name to meta because they know something, like you said. What do they know and why are they doing what they're doing? Yeah. Well, because that's where it's going, right? It's hard to wrap your head around it, but that is where it's going. So maybe you were just before your time because I feel like that that metaverse is going to, it's you know, that's going to trump the social platforms that we know today, right? Oh, because yeah, we're going to okay. interact in the metaverse, so it's going to be different, which is going to affect that. I'm business. lost. Hey, how you going over there, Dan? No, I'm, I'm lost. <laughs> Your brain looks like it's melting. I heard meta something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just build houses. <laughs> they do that meta in metaverse? Yeah, well, they do. <laughs> it's, it's, it's called the fucking sandbox, mate. <laughs> you buy plots yeah, in yeah. the sandbox. No, I wanted to ask you, mate. You what? You were uh, number one employee for or employer, employer, employer for two years or three years? Yeah, I mean, like the, the key thing for us is, I mean, that's an award that we went for. We won it. It was awesome, you know. And so it's, but for us, you know, they, we talk about the the idea of the performance defining component of the value chain, and that sounds like a bit of a mouthful. But you, if you can imagine, if you can imagine, like, if you drag an industry, if you kind of break a business apart into all of its kind of sub components, mm. you've got one part usually that really matters. And for us in social garden, it's the people part. Yeah. And so what we focus on, how do we get the best people to want to come and work for us? How do we treat them like gold, create great opportunities, listen to what they're saying, give them cadence over their own and agency over their own, you know, success 
um, and stuff like that. And so, you know, we really focus on trying to oh, make love it, man. Make it yeah, a great yeah, place. We to love work. We're big on culture. Yeah, we yeah. love it. And that's obviously you've nailed it there. Yeah, I think, you know, we're um it's always an evolving thing and, you know, different people wanna have work d- means different things to different people. And I yeah. think trying to kind of cater and understand what people are trying different to do. Different motivations, yeah. Different motivations and it's not yeah. always money, is it? Like people, a lot of the time the, it's not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the the common assumption is that people the motivation is money, but yeah, you start to feel, you start to realise that it's it's not. And we've said it a few times, and we always try, try and tell our listeners out there: if you are running a point, business or starting a business, <laughs> talking about Big E, yeah, Big E, <laughs> you got to look after you guys. You got to look after your employees. And you got to look after Big E. He gets looked after. He's got a fridge full of all stuff down there. We look after him, <laughs> and that's how you create the culture, isn't it? Yeah, like, yeah. and bringing good people, man. And and you know what? To to your point, you know, you we got looped in with you today through. DC, yeah. DC was one of our first employees, and and that we 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 poached him, man, because we just wanted, we just saw who he was, and we're like, you know what, dude, I don't know if this is exactly what you want to do, but come and work for us. And he's, um, yeah, he's been a big part of our culture now. Turn it 100%. around, get it around, there there is. Is. Yay! DC. You, you, you. <laughs> DC and I actually been homies for a while now. We play in the same touch footy team. Oh, no. Shout touch out, touch shout footy. out, Come on, man. Shout touch. out to the Kirans, <laughs> the three-time Kirans. champions, <laughs> your boy. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Are we going on? Gotcha. <laughs> no, I don't I'm think really. it's like that. DC said he dominated the other night. Was that true? Or? Mate, he's pretty sharp. Yeah, he's, pretty, yeah. he's, pretty, he's pretty telly on the... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're, look, we're so, oh. that's super interesting. All of this stuff, man. Because me and Pete, yeah. and, and I know Dan, we're in a bit of a parallel journey, and you're definitely further advanced in that journey to us. And I guess that's we've we've put a lot of so focus. It's nice in. to hear those. Yes, things man, it's are, reassuring. Even to go. though they're advanced, they're similar that's ideals and, and yeah. Um, yeah, baselines. It's, sure. it's interesting. Like, why we we I had lunch. I sat down next to um, this young woman that started with us. She's like twenty two. Is like a um, digital designer yesterday at lunch, and she was like. She's like, you know, what's it, what's it like? Uh, is it so stressful running a company kind of thing? And I was like, you know, I think it's a common misconception that it's like people think that, you know, if you've got one employee, employee versus a hundred employees, it's not a hundred times harder mm. yeah. to have a oh, hundred yeah. people. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's kind of everyone's own life experience. It kind of comes back to what are people, what everyone wants different things from their experience at work. And so it's just thinking about like, um, how do I describe this? It kind of feels to me like the things that the day that I was walking home and the rain it went down, it's like that felt as bad to me, worse to me at that time than any bad thing that I've had it happened to me recently. And it's all contextual. So it's like, you know, for her, if she can't find the right design and that puts her body in kind of a physical state of stress, it's the exact same feeling for her as some thing that would be perceived as being a bigger deal to me but I my physical response to that stressful situation is exactly the same as the physical response for her in terms of her stressful yeah. situation and I think you know re- remaining and kind of um, understanding where employees are coming from because it's like although you've got a lot of shit going on it's stressful for you it's like they've got shit going on as well yeah. and yeah. it's equally stressful for them yeah, yeah. correct correct because it's what it's what they know it's the big things in their life. That's yeah. that's. I think that's a good lesson to remember across the board. Hey, oh, oh, can we talk a little bit about property? I'm I'm a bit yeah. biased. I'm a bit biased. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we got I know you guys like to talk about your culture and your people. And stuff. <laughs> Here it is. But like, yeah, you're you know a big one for property. You know, obviously we've had we've had um you know pandemic going on, all that sort of stuff. There were there was there was it was a big deal at the start of that people were saying different things so called expert property market was going to dive it's going well, it's going to yeah. sink we're all done real estate real estate's <laughs> not a thing anymore thank god it's still rolling but um said so dad i'm not, moving not into the spare room <laughs> cuz we're fucked yeah <laughs> you know cuz i guess you know for yourself like you you know you've got a platform where people bring their property to sell um you know did you think that was going to take a big dive you know like, um you know we kind of when we kind of hit a crisis period and this is kind of a process we've followed for as long as we've been in it, when it's like, when there's a high degree of uncertainty, we sit down, George and I, and we say, okay, let's kind of just get everything out from our heads. So we're kind of not like telling ourselves this narrative, like, oh fuck, what if this happens and this mm. happens and this happens? Where half of it's, you know, may not happen. So what we do is we write down, what is the absolute worst case scenario that's going to happen? And then what is the absolute best case scenario that could happen? 
And then what we do is we write down all the things so we're kind of not letting ourselves kind of negatively think about all of these extremities and stuff. On a loop. On a loop yep. where it just becomes mm. unhelpful. And we write all the things down so we've got it out. We don't have to kind of be like, oh, fuck, we didn't think about this. This is other bad thing that might happen to us. And, we, and you kind of get in this thing <laughs> yeah, yeah. where you're just talking about all the bad stuff that can happen and you stop talking about the solutions to the problem that you've got. So we go down, we write down all the stuff, what's sort of bad, the worst case scenario, like, you know, we lose with the, the real estate market explodes and we lose the company and, uh, and like and it's like what would we do if that happened and kind of making a plan for the, each of the worst case scenarios focusing on how do we protect against the downside what, what are the things that we can do to manage parts of the risk of that stuff and then we finish the session with what's the absolute dream case scenario here and then what are the things that we can incre- and do to increase the probability of that scenario occurring mm. and so we kind of have these two plans we've got we know what we're going to do if the shit's the fan so then we don't have to keep talking about it we can just focus That's on execution put in the top drawer yep it's kind of it's not even in the drawer it's it's on, the t- it's on the table it's on the table and then we have the what's the best case scenario and what are all the opportunities that may come off the back of this mm. and we put that on next, oh, sitting that. right next opportunities, to it. opportunities yeah yeah and so There's like blood in the streets uh, yeah and it's like we kind of you know we talked about all the bad things that could have occurred when we went into COVID we talked about what are the things what are the different things one of the things was interest rates are probably going to go down mm. which means there's probably going to be a property boom which means it's probably going to be good for us. Well, how come you knew? <laughs> so, you, so you lost DC's number? <laughs> <laughs> but how did you, like, the, the crazy thing is, how did you know that, right? Because I feel like... He's like, a guru. I, yeah, but I'm not I'm not following all the all the economists and stuff, yeah. but my gut feel, the, the whispers that I was hearing, or the consensus or the sentiment was that the, there was going to be, it was going to be tough. It was going to be a... Doomsday. A, there was doomsday. So... so Clearly, that makes every bit of sense what you just said. The interest rates are going to go down because the the powers of B are going to have to make some tweaks to adjust, and that directly is going to infa- affect the property market positively. That makes sense. Yeah. How come all the economists were telling us that we'll screw? Because I drove away. We drove away from uh, our office here in Ivanhoe, and I drove home that one day when it really became real and thought there was that much uncertainty. I was like, I don't know what this is. But I feel like we're fucked. You know what I mean? Everyone's mm. saying like, "I'm not hearing the sentiment's not good." Don't know when it's going to end. Don't even know what it is. And it was pretty crazy. And it just didn't go that way. And it didn't even. I felt like I was working from home. We were all working from home. We were still making sales. People, you know, we were in property development. We were still developing property. It just went the opposite way. Did you, any thoughts on? why it went you know what I mean and just just to be clear I'm not some kind of messiah being like <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the property market <laughs> yeah, yeah. will go on and it's like, well that's what yeah, you we need buy or sell that's what we need to know <laughs> <laughs> nah, so, what, so what we what we did we planned as though it was going to be the plan worst for, plan for the worst hope planned, for the best exactly plan yep. for the worst hope for the best look for the signals of it going well look mm-hmm. for the signals it's going bad and then just adjust the plan accordingly the big thing for us we were like you know interest rates are probably going to go down which means the property market's probably going to like go okay but the big issue for us being in development because we don't work in established we only do new development yeah. um, is that the borders are going to shut and it's going to create issues around immigration which did play out yep. and um, but yeah and so we kind of just we kind of made a plan as though it was going to be the very worst but we were look and but we also wrote our good list and said mm. if shit starts going good what are we going to do and having a plan and we were like we're going to look at buying companies we're going to try grow the team because it means a lot of people are probably going to fire a whole bunch of people mm. that should have made the wrong call we kind of dropped our staff down in terms of hours and things like that planning because we you know if the worst preparing happens, for the worst yep. preparing for the worst then we started seeing then the interest rates conversation started coming out we're like yeah, this is the hope yeah, this really is what hoping yeah, for. Yeah, really yeah. yeah, and then um and then it started and so we didn't let anyone no, we, no one lost their job. So we got to look after all the staff oh, cool. and they where they we they sat on because we're like if it goes well, what are the things that are gonna matter? It's gonna we don't want to let go of any people because mm. we're gonna need them. Um and then so yeah, so we kind of made the plan based on the fact that we planned for the downside, leave ourselves the optionality on the upside, mm. and then had a plan of what we were gonna do and, and that involved moving the people back to full time I mean looking for acquisition opportunities of of like distressed companies in different parts of the market that are going to go through that process mm-hmm. um, and yeah and so we kind of just then as we just got the information we just based based our decisions based on the information that was becoming available was, was Shouter one of them that you jumped on was that was that post pandemic or, or during the pandemic that you jumped on Shouter uh, that was when the market was booming yep yeah and we were kind of like 
we see what's going on here. Yeah, we see what's going on. <laughs> it's just one of those ones. The reason we, the reason I invested in that company, uh, the founder is just an absolute jet. His bit was an early employee that they sold a, a tech company, a super successful exit previously. But they kind of have this unique model where if um, if I'm a um, like a uh, automotive dealership or a real estate agent or something like that effectively what happens is that we can i saw that the future of that business i think was going to be being able to plug their micro gifting system to be able to send like and buy you a beer or, or mm. coffee or lunch or whatever how cool would it be if you could p- like plug that into a, a marketing automation tool so say i buy a, I, I buy a house from you yeah and i move in and then a year later you want to like do something a surprise and delight kind of thing and you could set up your crm that it would automatically buy me lunch with a personalized message from you that's cool that's insane that's yeah cool. that's or gross. bottle of beer or you a, know bottle of wine or all that kind of stuff and it's like wow. it's just a really effective way to engage yeah. with people automatically in a meaningful mm-hmm. offline way and effectively most of the in my view a lot of the fintechs particularly with the afterpay deal recently a lot of those businesses are based on um like evaluation per user so they and effectively the most challenging part of building a fintech company is acquiring users at scale and so by virtue of them being able to sell the solution to businesses mm. and then the business require like effectively giving something means the person that's receiving the money needs to download the app on their phone absolutely mm. so you get this b to b to c at massive scale, very low cost because the user doesn't, you don't have to advertise to the end user. They have to, to get the money. It's, it's basically this organic growth strategy. Yeah. And then I think, you know, the way that plays out is I've got just a massive, you know, able to acquire FinTech customers at scale, very fast. Um, in an organic manner. In an organic that's manner. That's mind blowing, money. Yeah. Wow. And so that's kind of why, um, and then we, fortunate one of the people that's been great to us is a guy Steve Kloss who's on the board at car sales was part of the founding team and he kind of he's kind of coached us for maybe like five years or so and I called him and I was like hey man I was like, I've seen this kind of fintech play I kind of think it's a good one because you know I think with the real estate stuff I also think for the automotive space it will be good and he wrote he's the CEO of a company called Pentana which have like 60% of all of the CRMs of all of the car dealerships in Australia and I was like, if he thinks it's a good idea and that he thinks the dealerships would do it, I'm like, and he wants to invest with me, I'm mm. like, oh, man. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, yeah, man, we're on. Nice. Yeah. So you still invest in other companies? Yeah, yeah. So we, spot, what about uh, building company? <laughs> <laughs> He's got the Midas <laughs> touch. I know, I see what's going on here. He's got the Midas touch. Oh, mate, <laughs> Development I'm, company? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the market. The, um, I, reckon, I reckon you got this, man. You don't need investment. That's the other thing. We kind of never raise money. And I, uh, in most cases, I think a lot of companies – that are raising huge amounts of money and focusing all of their effort on raising money rod. is the wrong it's thing a rod to for focus their, on. Yeah, it's a rod for their back, for sure. It's a rod for their back, and we're kind of fortunate that the you know we sold a small amount of equity to some really great people. One was the former C, group COO from REA, who, who's been, as you can imagine, quite yeah, helpful. Cool, yeah. <laughs> um, another dude, David Trewern, who's been like a close like, mentor and friend, and uh, he had Flightboard, which is like, have you guys seen that on... It's kind of like a um, a foiling system. So it's like a surfboard almost with a foil and it's got an electric motor. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, they're yeah, cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. founder of that. Yeah. Um, before that, he had like a, you know, four or 500 person kind of digital agency vibe. So we had, we sold small amount, rather than raising money, we went down the service path first. And I think that's the other thing that I would, if people are looking at kind of like, yeah, I want to get into tech, my recommendation would definitely be find a way that you can provide the core value of what the techno- what the technology you want to build, is there a way that you can deliver the core value that the technology provides without using technology and don't raise the money, sell it as a service? Focus on getting the service adopted, mm-hmm. work out what the problems are with the market, and then as you kind of understand the things that you should you can that are successful when you run it manually, then you can kind of go, okay, cool. We know this works, this works, this works, and this works. This shit doesn't work. And if you'd built the technology from the start, you would have built a whole bunch of technology yeah. that would be redundant. And then you'd have to raise money to build the technology. Right. So you start with the, you kind of do the things that are manual on this, and that the technology will eventually automate, knowing that it doesn't really matter so much about the margins and things in the short term. It's just kind of breaking even, getting the customer base rolling, getting engagement, getting feedback on what people care about. Mm-hmm. And then as you get more certainty over time, converting this manual process into a technology solution. And that's where the margins come. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that's wow. that's really good. Now, Heavy, yeah. oh, PK, oh, that's should, awesome. I've got one. I've got one question. I want to ask one more. One more question. <laughs> you've, got, <laughs> one more. You've, you've got one more. Yeah, right? is that all we got? We're at no, 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 you're, no, right, no. you're right. 
Mate, obviously, big entrepreneur. I want to know what your biggest challenge was in all of your businesses and how you overcame that. You might have already answered that. I think the biggest challenge. I think it's kind of just the mindset stuff of staying staying balanced and trying to stay, not get, because I'm kind of like an excitable person by nature. And yeah, I like yeah. really enjoy the process and the wins and like, you know, and um, and just finding a way to remain not too frothy when the going's good and not too gutted when the going's bad and just kind of trusting the process a little bit. Nice. And that's kind of something that it was difficult at the start and it's difficult now. <laughs> Still difficult. Still difficult. Yeah, okay. Nice. Yeah. yeah. But I kind of, I think for the big thing that I've learned as well through the process is that you get a lot of value from the, because a lot of people go into business because they want to make money mm. and they want to like define their own future and all that stuff and it's like all of that stuff's great but it's actually not the often not the thing that you kind of get the real happiness from and so I'm uh, we do a lot of work with a group called Igniting Change okay. and we donated 1% of the equity of Social Garden 1% of the equity of Urban 1% of all of the time in Social Garden every year goes we donate to not for profits wow. um, and, and we do it through this group called Igniting Change who is, which is led by the most unbelievable woman you have ever met in your yeah, life. Yeah, royalty. Her name's Jane Tucson, yep. um, and she's just like amazing. She actually was the co-founder of Comic Relief in the UK, which is like one of the most successful charities before ever. It's, before, yeah, before it's time, like mm. tr- plays the trail, didn't they? Yeah, and so I've learned. And Red Nose. Red Nose, Red Nose Day, yep. is a, yep. it's all from all from her and, and a co-founder. And, um, and I think I've learned so much about what it means to be happy and to, what it means to kind of give back and the joy that – and, and it's kind of a, almost a selfish pursuit in some ways where it's like, it's great to give someone a leg up, but man, it feels good as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? It's nearly <laughs> selfish. It's nearly selfish. It's nearly yeah. selfish. Yeah. But you yeah, kind yeah. Of, and I think like that's the other thing we, you know, one of the lessons we learned was like, it's so easy when the highs are high and the lows are low to kind of get so caught up in that moment. And then if you can just have something that you do that's not about yourself. Greater purpose. A greater purpose yeah. where you're like, I'm kind of doing it for me and I'm doing it for the staff and I'm doing it for my business partners and I'm doing it for my family, but I'm also doing it for people that I don't know that kind of deserve a break. Mm. And I think kind of finding a way in the early stages of the business to integrate the kind of profit for a purpose mm. piece has really kind of helped us to remain balanced and focused and those kind of inevitable ups and downs because it kind of, you're like, well, if we fucking lose it all, we've at least done all this done good something. shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. Did you have something? Yeah, I just had one more uh, property question. You get one more now. Too. Yeah, yeah. On I, I, no, 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 I did because we sort of just follow up what I was saying before. Do you have any insights on where you think it's going? I know you've mentioned uh, you were early into the Bitcoin and stuff like that and we just spoke about uh, Facebook changing to the metaverse. What are you guys talking about behind closed doors? No one's listening. Yeah. It's all good. <laughs> but yeah, what are you, what are you yeah, anticipating or are you seeing a shift or any trends or anything? Yeah. I mean, like, I've got quite strong views and whether they're right or wrong, I kind of think we obviously think and talk about this stuff like a lot. Um, I think the discrepancy between the apartment market and the land market is obviously it's never been so high. And I think apartments are due for a good run. Um, mm. and I, and I know that's kind of a, and if you'd asked me two years ago, mm. I would have been like, not as, no, that would not be my perspective. Yep. It's great to buy an apartment because you want to live in and around the lifestyle. And that's, that's why people buy apartments a lot of the time, or the investors are looking for yield, not so much capital growth. But I think we're going to, I think we're coming up to a period where my kind of guess for next year is I think apartments may outstrip houses for the first time in terms of capital growth for a super long time. Um, and you know, and but well built apartments as well because there's a lot of shit mm. apartments, and that's kind of why we one of the reasons we started Urban because we would hear on the calls because we also have a, our social gun business, we generate leads, then we call the customer on behalf of our client and talk to them. And so what we found is there was a lot of uncertainty around the quality of development. I think that is a real issue, and it really matters who you're buying from. But I think if those kind of particularly that old like 1970s mm. stuff that's really well built, that's kind of unrenovated things. Like, I think there's a big opportunity in and around that space um and then i reckon and and then just i know with the what looking at our data the townhouse market is 
absolutely popping off the charts. Yeah. <laughs> we, we ran this like we ran this super complicated data science project uh, across. That's all we want. Yeah. 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 Bahamas PKs. That sounds good. <laughs> here's here's one for you. So we did we we ran this kind of um, data science with this like data science. We're like, yeah, we're going to kind of find out all this analysis because we've seen like we've sent millions of emails through our kind of urban business and a lot of it's kind of automation and stuff. And we were like, you know, what's the words that we can say in the email that'll have the highest predictor of whether the lead becomes a lead? And we were like, like guessing of like, is it going to be like, is it about the price? Is it about the location? Is it about, how, you know, what could it what could it be? And do you know what it was? And it was three times higher is that if the word townhouse was included in the email, wow. the user was three times more likely to click. Oh, wow. wow eh? Relative to apartments. Yeah, that's mine. Yeah, look, that's at awesome. their, look at the lips. Yes. Hey. Look at their lips over there. They're just <laughs> licking it up. Yeah, <laughs> Put the drool back in. That's all right. <laughs> but um, okay, but yeah, so my, my view is that yeah. I think, you know, the, the land prices can't continue to go up. There's probably going to be a change in interest rates towards the end of next year. Mm -hmm. I think what we're going to see is election mid-year, immigration open shortly after that, interest rates change after that. The kind of price growth in land is going to slow. The kind of apartment prices are going to catch up a little bit mm. not like they're not going to be like overtaken by any stretch but i think the current discrepancy between apartments and land is, is, is it's going to get bridged yep. and then i think we're going to see a massive um period of migration of uh, not migration of like a changing from the low density middle ring converting into medium density yep and i think that's gonna it's gonna be driven by the townhouse market and then it's going to go up i reckon on the inner ring and driven by certain areas driven by certain businesses <laughs> <laughs> okay. built by others built by yeah, ah, built, well, yeah. and advertised shout by others yeah. 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 shout out Nana May talking about quality yeah quality we're all together quality. it's yeah. all three of us what about one more one more I know I said one more but I'm really interested oh. man block because you because you clearly know a thing or two about blockchain do you look and this is a deep conversation so just on a surface level do you see blockchain coming in and disrupting the property market in any kind of way? Uh, I don't think it's going to dis... I mean, like people, like groups like Pixar and others, I think company, like in terms of um, optimizing the transaction from a user experience standpoint is totally so, going to... So maybe peer-to-peer -peer instead peer of having the intermediaries? Uh, to be honest, I reckon REA is not going anywhere. I think the network effects that I've got in the established market, there's a reason we're not going after established. It's not because yeah. we like, <laughs> don't like established. <laughs> it's, because, it's because we think the opportunities are new. Um, and do I think the block? I think the blockchain is going to be as big a change as uh, similar to the change of, with the internet. Yep. I would suggest, and I think D, I think the, where it's going to be, oh, if I, okay. yeah, it's going to be in the property market. It's actually going to be more in the finance side, and I reckon de decentralized finance or like DeFi yep. is going to become um, mainstream over the next. So 10 through the 50. smart contracts, lending the money, yeah, peer to peer, so that's peer to peer, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I reckon the banks have got a good strategy in the sense that they're kind of you know. Um, my view is they should have, the banks probably should have tried to buy um, ARIA um, 15 years ago, yeah. if they could have. Um, and uh, I think that would have been a good play because I think realestate.com.au is a material risk to the big four. Um, and I reckon that- Was even there getting into lending? Yeah, they're well, getting into lending. lending for a little bit, mate. That they are they just, such they a well-run company. Into everything, like that, honestly, <laughs> yeah. they the are a beast. And I reckon yep. they're going to be big. And I reckon so it's REA in Australia is a risk for the big four. And then I think, um, and then I think the decentralized finance is next. But mm. I mean, fuck, what do I know as well? Like that's just my. Oh, guess. I reckon the same thing. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, <laughs> sounding all right. Sounding all right. Now, Mike, this has been awesome. Usually, you know, we ask like, you know, you're doing work for charity, that sort of stuff. We've touched on it. Is there anything you just wanted to back over? You know, you want people to get around. Any links um, you want us to drop in thing? the description? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, sure. it would be awesome um, if. If uh, you are kind of going into business, one thing to think about is the one percent pledge. As I said before, it's like the you yeah, see what the toughest toughest challenges are. Mm. It's like the kind of balancing the highs and the lows. So that's something we can do yeah. as a business. I mean, Pete can you guys can do it. It's one. It's called the one percent pledge. Um, they're kind of making it increasingly easy to do it because no one wants to deal with like more paperwork and headaches, and you retain all the kind of control and everything. And igniting change is actually helping to helping organizations to do that so that's the onboarding they help you onboard that onboarding set that up. yep um herbert smith freehills which is one of the big law firms have developed a whole bunch of the contracts and things related to it to make to protect the founder but to make it really easy and low cost to do it 
that's now happening. So if you um, get in touch, I'm sure we'll be able to point you in the right direction with that. The other one is we've um, launched a notebook on for igniting change. Um, it's uh, it's got a whole bunch of stories from different community organisations. Some of them are kind of indigenous um, education with a group called Children's Ground, the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre with the ASRC. Um, and a whole bunch of different kind of emerging community organisations. None, it's not a profit exercise. It's obviously the the sales are going to a not for profit, <laughs> and all the money goes out. Um, but what the book has, which is a, I think it's actually a really good tool for uh, employee engagement. Um, and the reason is because the talent war is super real out there. People employees want to feel like they're they're doing it for a reason other than to make the owner a whole bunch of money. Mm-hmm. And so what the book does, it's called Take Note, and there's a QR code that's inside the notebook you take your um take your phone out you scan the code and then it ha- gives you a story from the founder of the not-for-profit organization talking about what they're trying to what change they're trying to make in the world and how you can kind of get around yeah, it yeah that's, that's awesome. cool and the notebooks yeah, are 10 well. bucks each and it's just a good a good cool thing to do that supports not-for-profits supports a good message now i love that guys now are you guys done with your question yeah, yeah we're, we're done, done. We're good. you're good yeah good beautiful good. guys mike <laughs> that's been awesome man like really really yeah, really good amazing um that's it guys thanks again please like share subscribe all that sort of stuff anyone who's going to get value out of this and a lot of value just happened right now so uh yeah please like share subscribe that's it guys see you at the top you You. (laughs) (laughs) sorry about benny calling you mick (laughs) (laughs) i'm not calling you mick again (laughs) oh my that's awesome that's fun oh you know why because my dad's mick yeah right so i've got it i've got it i was really gonna pull you up on it